when my wife's family, her grandmother has a farm out in central Indiana. And early on, I was invited down there for a Thanksgiving dinner and headed in, and, and, and literally it changed my life because I had never known a farm feast before. It was this grand presentation of turkey and stuffing and ham and potatoes and noodles and that green stuff with the crusty things on top and macaroni and cheese and homemade rolls. And it was just awesome. And for the last 30 plus years, I have enjoyed Thanksgiving dinner at the farm. I learned early on that it was a non-negotiable uh, my wife mentioned that we would be there for Thanksgiving, uh, not only that year, but every year following. And I was okay with it, based on the food. And coming to the farm for a meal, as I soon realized, was sort of a rite of passage. This was family and extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins. And when you were brought into this farm meal, that meant you have arrived in the family. Well, it was, I think, last year that my youngest daughter invited a boyfriend to the farm Thanksgiving meal. His name was Bryce. Now, as a pastor, I am now the default prayer at the meal. So I you know, was asked to kind of pray at, at each time. And, and I thought to myself, you know, Bryce is a great guy, and wouldn't it be fun to just mess with him a little bit? Because I know he's nervous. I know he wants to make a good first impression. I know he doesn't know hardly anybody around this huge table. How can I mess with Bryce? Because deep down, I am a sinner. Um, but So I thought, okay, before I pray, I'm going to tell Bryce that it is our family tradition to go around the table and share something we're most thankful for, because that sounds believable. And I was going to invite him to go first. So I did. And, you know, good on him. He, he, he stumbled and shocked and turned white and, and, and almost passed out, but yet managed to come up with something in which the whole rest of the family was like, didn't know if we should just laugh at having kind of punked him or if now we're supposed to all share something good as we go around the table. And in thinking about that day, one, boy, that was just mean and cruel. But two, you know, there are a lot of families that share something they're thankful for before they eat. Before they eat, And we have a Thanksgiving service at our Chesterton campus where we have an open mic to share something we're thankful for that has happened with us or to us. And maybe, maybe at least in my family or maybe in a lot of families, we've lost that push to be thankful. We've lost that, that, um, that passion for Thanksgiving to say those things that we are thankful to God for. Maybe it's, our heads move on to other stuff. There's always some other worry and some other care. Maybe it is that we just don't stop enough to pause and praise. As a kid growing up, uh, there were two things you always knew you needed to be afraid of. The first one, based on every cartoon or adventure show I'd ever seen, was quicksand. Anybody ever fall in quicksand? Yeah, me neither. But yet, it seemed like something we needed to worry about. Because it seemed our favorite heroes always ended up in there. But the second thing was what happens if we catch fire? Anybody here ever catch fire? Okay, good. Anybody here, if you did catch fire, would you know the three things you're immediately supposed to do? Stop, drop, and roll. So yes, stop, drop, and roll. This was drilled into us as kids. We were told all the time, when you catch fire, you... You got it. And I don't know, again, if that happened to me, I, don't, I think it would be scream, run, and cry. But maybe, just maybe, it would be so instinctual that I would stop and just start rolling around on the floor, and catch the carpet on fire and everything else. Well, if we all know that our first response to catching fire should be to stop, drop, and roll, what should our first response be 
when we've been blessed with something? Is gratitude, what if gratitude was drilled into us as much as fire prevention? There's a saying that says gratitude is the attitude that sets the altitude for living. Gratitude is the attitude that sets the altitude for living. When we are living with gratitude, when we are living, giving praise and thanksgiving to God for what He's done for us, it changes our perspective, it changes our mindset, and it changes our view of the situations we're in. So today I propose that we take stop, drop, and roll, and we modify it to stop, drop, and praise. Everybody together, just like we did with the fire. Stop drop. Very good. One more time, just so you remember. Excellent. For a lot of us, we're just so busy. There are things going on, we're always running on to the next thing, but every once in a while we need to remember that we need to absolutely stop, drop to our knees, and be thankful for what God has done to us. We teach our kids to say please and thank you when they want something. And and for a kid, early on, you say it because, well, mom and dad told you you had to in order to get something. But as parents, we hope it kind of sticks. We hope that please and thank you become a regular part, not just of our kids' vocabulary, but because of who they are. That they are actually gracious and thanking someone. We want them to stop, drop, and praise. The book of Luke tells a story where Jesus was headed toward Jerusalem. And he was in this place right outside between Galilee and Samaria. And he and his disciples are walking, and there are ten men there. Ten of them gathered that have leprosy. Leprosy is a very contagious disease. And people with leprosy were cast out from their communities because they were so contagious. They had to live outside of where they would have been. And these men see Jesus coming, and they cry out to him. They say, Jesus, have mercy on us. And Jesus approaches the tent and says, go show yourselves to the priest. Because in order to be declared clean or unclean, that fell on the responsibility of the priest at the time. If you were going to be allowed back in, then it was the priest who had to decide that you had been cured or healed, that you could once again be in community with everyone else. So these men were suddenly, they were healed. And they were celebrating. And they all headed off to go see the priest. One man comes back. One man to thank Jesus. Praising God, the scripture tells us. Praising God and thanking Jesus for what he had done. And Jesus' response, didn't I heal ten men? And yet only one comes back, and he's a Samaritan. Jesus says to him, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Only one man out of those ten gave praise to God for being healed. Well, we are in a series called Being Honest with God. We're looking at Psalms, and we've been looking at some of the different emotions that are in the Psalms, and today we're going to get a reminder to stop, drop, and praise from Psalm 118. So if you brought your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. If you need one, I've got a little book rack in the back under that lamp. Feel free to grab one. If you want to keep it, that's our gift to you. Psalm 118. There's a lot in Psalm 118. We could talk about it for weeks, but we're not going to. We're going to take kind of a a 30,000-foot view and dip in on a few different things. We're not going to touch on everything, but we're going to touch on quite a bit. So as we approach God's Word, uh, let's pray. God, this morning as we open your Word, as we read the words of the psalmist, may we be reminded to stop, drop, and praise to be thankful to you, God, for what you've done for us, to be thankful to you, God, for the ways you've moved in our lives, to give you praise for who you are and for what you've done. So take these few moments, Lord. Help us to quiet down the thoughts of our day, to take away uh, the concerns of our day and the things we need to do next, Lord, but to just stop and lean in and focus on you in this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So the author of the psalm is not David, or at least we don't know. The author is unknown, so the history of some of the specifics that are in here aren't known. There's some events that happen in the psalm that we hear about, but we don't exactly know exactly how to pinpoint what was happening at the time. And sometimes I think for us that's better. Sometimes I think when we're given a a situation where the details are a little sketchy and a little blurry, sometimes I think that helps us because if we have too much information, then we tend to, to, to compartmentalize the concept. We say, oh, well, this only applies in this situation. This only applies with this particular thing and not necessarily see how it applies to us. So I think it's a good thing that we don't really know everything that happened here, but that we can still take what we read and apply it into our lives and to use it going forward. Sometimes Scripture is unclear, and that tends to work for our benefit. We do know that this psalm is part of a a, a series of psalms, five of them called the Egyptian Hallel. Hallel from the word hallelujah. They are a set of psalms that are celebrating Passover, celebrating that time in Jewish history when they were slaves in Egypt and when uh, the, the spirit of death passed over their homes as part of one of the plagues that was sent to, before they were freed from Egyptian captivity. And they knew that by putting the blood of a lamb onto their doorpost that that spirit would pass over their house and move on to the next. And that was the, 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 the thing that broke Pharaoh's back, basically, and got them freed from Egypt. That was the movement of God that freed them. And they were saved by that blood, by the indication of it. So these psalms are ones that were sung at the celebration of those events, at the celebration of Passover. And Psalm 118 is the last of them, and this is typically, typically used after the Passover dinner as a time of celebration, and we'll get a little more into that in a little bit. But they are all reminders to give God praise for what He's done. So Psalm 118, again, is a reminder to stop, drop, and praise. The psalmist begins and ends the psalm with the exact same verse. It says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord. Give give praise to Him. And the psalmist lays out right at the beginning three reasons to praise. What's the first one? (laughs) Exactly. For He is good. God is good. There is no evil in God. There is no bad intent in the things that He does. God's actions are pure. God's actions are true. God can be trusted 100% of the time because God is good, more so than man. We can have ulterior motives. We can have side reasons in the back of our head. Not everything that we do is done with the absolute purest of intent. We're typically not good. But God is good. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. He is good and give thanks to Him because of His love for us. What kind of love for us? Steadfast love. The good God loves you. And that love is steadfast. That means that it's going to last. It's not going to stop. It's not dependent on your actions. It's not dependent on you ever not letting God down. Because you will. But God's love is steadfast. For us. God's love will last for us. It's not going to stop. You may fail, you may drift away, you may fall away, you may run away, but God loves you no matter what. And how long is that love going to last? Forever. Forever. This steadfast, unchanging love will last forever. It will not change. It will not end. It will not run out. God God lives outside of time. And therefore, eternity being something we can't wrap our heads around, His love will still last through all of eternity, beyond the bounds of time and space. This steadfast love of a good God will last forever. 
Those are some high praises. That's a pretty good reason to praise and celebrate. And, and the, psalmist, the psalmist goes on and tells us who it is that should be singing those praises. He says, let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the people of Liberty Valpo say, absolutely. Can we bring that last slide back up? So here you've got three different groups of people. You've got, what? there we go, you've got Israel. These are the Jews. Let those, the Jewish people, God's people, let them say his love endures forever. Now this psalm was written to be sung during Passover. This is a celebration. And everybody kind of gathers at Passover at the temple. And in the courts inside the temple are the Jewish people. Let them say and celebrate that his love endures forever. And then in the inner courts, you've got the house of Aaron. These are the ministers, the priests. They're the ones that are leading the celebration. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. And then outside those courts, you've got those who fear the Lord. People that weren't necessarily born Jewish, but people that converted to the faith. People that were brought in to that relationship with this loving God. Let them say his love endures forever. For the Gentiles, his love endures forever. For all of us in this room, his love endures forever. All three of these groups would have been gathered in celebration. And all are saying the exact same word of praise. These words aren't just for Passover, they're for us. This is a cry that should be coming out from every one of us. That his love endures forever. Now that's not always easy to do. It's not always easy to find yourself in a situation that may be tough or difficult or life-altering and go, his love endures forever. Give thanks for he is good because we don't always see that. We don't always feel that. Today I want us to see a couple of things we can do when we're in that situation. Because the most important thing is to stop, drop, and praise. The first thing we can do when we find ourselves in a situation where we find it hard to be giving praise is to stop and ponder God's faithfulness. To think about it. To remember those times when He has been faithful in the past. We, uh, a couple weeks ago, I talked about my wife uh, and the traumatic brain injury that she suffered, and the spinal cord damage uh, that she suffered after surgery. Well, that was just the beginning of our story. There were more things that happened after that, and, and, and shortly after being part of, uh, adopted into Liberty, uh, she was hospitalized again for about a month. And you guys actually, we called off the service on Sunday and just spent time in prayer uh, as I was up at Northwestern. And what had happened was uh, she had woken up in the morning on a Sunday morning with a blister about the size of a softball on her leg. And it was Sunday, so I had to work. Um, but we've had infections before, and we've had things go on, and I just figured, okay, this will be fine. So I come in, and I'm in here in the service, and, and we're getting started, and we're on like the third song, and, and my watch is just going crazy with notifications. And it's my second oldest daughter who decided, you know, we decided it would be good. Let's at least bring Janet to the hospital, get her to the ER, and give her a shot, clear up whatever it is. And on the way to the hospital, my wife just stopped responding, stopped answering, stopped knowing where she was, all of that. So my second oldest is texting me, Daddy, almost done. I hadn't even started. Well, tell him to hurry up. Well, okay. Silent. Keep going on. But my phone just kept going, and my watch just kept going. And what had happened was my wife had uh, developed a condition called necrotizing fasciitis, a flesh-eating bacteria. 
and as a result of that had fallen into septic shock. Her organs were shutting down. And that led to, you know, a, a week here in the hospital, of an airlift to Chicago, all kinds of touch-and-go situations. And as a part of it, because this flesh-eating bacteria was in her leg, most of the meat had to be removed from her leg to get to the layer where the infection was. And I have some really, really gnarly pictures of what that leg looks like without, you know, skin or flesh in parts. And if you've got a strong stomach and want to check it out sometime, I'll, I'll show you. Um, well, we took those mostly to document what was going on. And that has been, what, three, four years now? And uh, we've been on the healing track since then. It's very, very slow. It takes a while for a leg to grow back. And we have weekly visits to a, a wound care clinic and an infectious disease clinic and all kinds of other stuff. And there are times when my wife gets extremely frustrated with the slowness of the progress, where it, takes, it seems like we're not making any progress, where it seems like we're going to be like this forever. And sometimes I'll be sitting in the, in the wound care office, and I'll be sitting you know, in the chairs, and she's kind of up on the seat thing, and they unwrap her leg and are treating it, and, and, and I'll see her on her phone, just kind of flipping through pictures, because she has all the gnarly leg pictures on there too. And when you look at what it looked like before versus what it looks like now, well, it still doesn't look pretty, but it looks so much better than where it was. And those times of frustration like, oh, this isn't healing, oh, this is taking forever, go away when she looks back and sees the progress that she actually has made. I think it's important for all of us to pick up to look back on our lives. Because when we look back and identify those times when God was faithful in our life, when we found ourselves in situations that it didn't seem like there was a clear way out, when we found ourselves in times where there was struggle and difficulty, and we see God moved, and we stop and are intentional about remembering those times, intentional about focusing on yeah, God was very faithful right here in my life. When we can see those places where he's moved before, we can find and remember that faithfulness. One of my favorite Old Testament stories is when uh, the people of Israel had, were standing in front of the Jordan River and it was swirling and churning and it was overflowing its banks because it was flood season and the priests were instructed to step into the water so that they could cross. And they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulder and it doesn't seem like a good idea, but they take that step in faith. And the water stops upstream, and all of a sudden, the path is made so that the people could cross safely to the other side. And when they get to the other side, they're given a command. Go get the big stones from the middle of the river. These are stones that were river rock. They were big, large stones that wouldn't have been on the shore, and they were polished smooth from the water rushing over them. They could only have come from the middle of that river. Get those. One from each tribe of Israel. Grab 12, stack them up at the other end of the river. Why? Someday your kids are going to ask, what's this all about? What's this big stack of stones for? And you can tell them. You can remind them of God's faithfulness. You can remind them of that steadfast love that brought you through that difficulty. We need to be stacking more stones in our life. We need to be holding on to the memories or taking the gnarly pictures or doing something to remember those times when God was faithful so that we can look back and remind ourselves of those. That helps us get that framework to stop, drop, and praise. The psalmist takes the next few verses and he shares what it is that God had done for him. He says this, Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. The Lord's on my side. 
What do I have to be afraid of? What could anyone do to me because the Lord is on my side? He's the one who's looking out for me. There's a saying, usually in Chicago politics or business, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And we know the king. We know the creator of all things. We know this good God whose steadfast love endures forever. The book of Romans uh, has a New Testament version of almost the same thing. Romans 8 says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? Amen. For I am sure that neither life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. His steadfast love endures forever. Not one thing. Nothing can pull us apart from him. Nothing can come in and separate us because we're partnered with the right one. Picture the kid on the playground who's getting bullied and his like seven foot, 300 pound older brother comes over. We got that guy in our corner. And we've got that option to praise him and to partner with him and to stop and drop and praise. We can ponder God's faithfulness, but we should also then partner with him. Our song continues at verse 8. It says, It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Fun fact about verses 8 and 9. How many people know the fun fact about verses 8 and 9? Okay, I'm going to tell you. Verse 8 and verse 9 of Psalm 118 are the exact middle of your Bible. They're the same number of verses before it and the same number of verses after it. All of Scripture, the exact center of all of it, is this. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust God. In princes. It's better than to take refuge in love than trust in man. That passage is saying it's important with who we're putting our trust in. It's important to put our trust in the right place. Who are you partnering with? It's better to find your refuge, your safe place in God than it is to put it in man. It's not saying never trust people. It's not saying all people will let you down. But eventually, you will be let down. And it's better to take your refuge in God than in any human being. As a matter of fact, it's better to trust in Him than any government. It's better to trust in Him than the princes of this world. Who is it you're relying on? Who is your refuge? Is it people? Is it political parties? Or is it the Lord? We can trust and rely on Him because His steadfast love endures what? Forever. We can stop and drop and praise him. The psalmist goes on. He starts to recount uh, some of the things specifically that God has done. Starting in verse 10. All nations surrounded me. Okay, so we've got a battle of some kind going on here. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. There was a victory. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. Okay, it was bad. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling. But the Lord helped me. Again, we don't know which battle this was. We don't know where this happened. But clearly, when things seemed hopeless, 
trusting in the Lord, they'd found their victory. And because of this recounting, because of what had happened, because of what God had done there, he can move on to the last phase that we have, and that's to proclaim his goodness. Because of what had happened in his history, and because he's remembering it, because he's focusing on the past and when God was faithful, he can then stop to celebrate. Verse 14 picks up. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. You can see that praise moving from an individual level. I shall not die. I pushed too far. I moved too far. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. You can see that celebration on an individual, individual level, but then it moves to a corporate level. He follows it up with glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The whole gathering is now stopping to praise God for what he's done. I shall not die, he says, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. He will live. He was in a terrible situation. He didn't think life was going to be the end result. But no, God has delivered him. God has become his salvation. He's going to live. And as a result, he is going to tell others about what he's done. I'm going to read those passages from a different translation. This is the Good News translation. It says this, I will tell of your goodness. All day long I will speak of your salvation though it is more than I can understand. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will proclaim your goodness, yours alone. You have taught me ever since I was young, and I still tell of your wonderful acts. Now that, I'm old, now that I am old and my hair is gray, do not abandon me. Oh God, be with me while I proclaim your power and your might to all generations who come. God has been faithful to me. And I can look back and see his faithfulness, but I'm not just keeping it to myself. I will tell of your goodness. I will speak of your salvation. I will proclaim your goodness. I will still tell of your wonderful acts. Well, I proclaim your power and might to all generations who come. We have a responsibility to share God's faithfulness with those who are coming behind us. We have a responsibility of not only experiencing God's faithfulness, but telling of it, sharing it with others. We have taken the last month, and in order to celebrate and give our volunteers and kids ministry a break, we've had kids in the service with us. Well, next week, it fires back up, and we've got some new things that are about to happen and some new directions and some new changes. It's going to be really, really great down there. And you have a responsibility to share God's faithfulness with the next generation. And this is my shameless plug right now to remind you that we need you to do that here. That we need volunteers to help share God's faithfulness with the next generation. Because it says so right here. So stop by the Welcome Center after the service and let them know you're ready to help out down there. Once a month. Once every six weeks. That's all we're asking. Please help us to proclaim God's faithfulness to the next generation right here in this building. But see, it's not just on a Sunday. But it's all times through your life, wherever you are. Tell your kids. Tell your kids' kids. Tell the neighbor's kids. Tell anybody who will listen the stories of God's faithfulness in your life. Because that's the kind of thing we can remember and respond to, especially when we're in those dark times. That's what, especially when it seems like we're not making progress, especially when it seems like there's no hope ahead. When we look back and are reminded of those times that God's faithfulness has been there, when His steadfast love came up before and we know it will endure forever. All of this brings us back to praising God, to thanking Him for his goodness and his love, to stop and drop and praise. We thank God for what he's done for us. And we are reminded, and we should be reminding ourselves of what he's done. 
Our passage ends the same way it started. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. You know what to do when you catch fire, but now I want you to know what to do when it seems like you face struggle or when you've seen God come through to stop, drop, and praise. Let's pray. Lord God, you have been faithful throughout our lives. God, you have been faithful to love us, to care for us, to save us. Even when it seemed like there was no hope, there was hope in you. And help us, Lord, to be reminded of those times to remember your love, to remember your faithfulness to us, and to stop and glorify you for it, to give you praise for what you've done and for how you've loved us. May our, your praise be on our lips, that we will tell others, that we will remind ourselves and we will share with the next generation your faithfulness. Thank you, God. Pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <laughs>